Hi, everybody. Hope everyone is doing well today, uh, wherever in the world you are. I am excited to take you through the future of the creator economy and then how the creator economy intersects with marketplaces. Um, so bear with me as I sip my coffee. I'm still waking up a little bit here in San Francisco, but uh, excited to chat with everyone today. So I want to cover a few things today. Um, the first is what is a creator? And so going through a little bit of history of how I think about what a creator is, uh, some misconceptions of the creator economy, what people get wrong, why this is a unique moment in time for this new motion, um, the framework that I use and that the team at Index uses to think through the creator world, and then just what are some interesting marketplace ideas uh, or opportunities or investment theses to think through. And my goals are for everyone to think through learnings about um, what's interesting about the creator world is it's, it's intersections of Gen Z and consumer social, it's crypto, it's gaming, um, it's really a lot of things all at once. And then also just getting a view of how we got here, where we're at, where we're going, and what actual companies are building can be started here, can be invested against, um, but what, what is interesting to folks to actually take away here. So first, let's start with what is a creator? This is a question that... Um, a lot of people ask a lot, and I like to start with this quote from Barry Diller. So this isn't to you know make fun of Barry Diller or be too harsh on him. He, if people don't know, was the CEO of both Paramount and Fox. He started IAC, which is incubated Expedia and Match Group. He's really one of the, the main media moguls of the last 25 years. But he had this quote in 2005 where he said, there's not that much talent in the world. There are very few people in very few closets in very few rooms that are really talented and can't get out. People with talent and expertise in making entertainment products are not going to be displaced by 1,800 people coming up with their videos that they think are going to have an appeal. So yikes. Um, he said this in October 2005 in an article with Wired. And just a few months earlier, a little company called YouTube had launched in a room above a pizza shop in San Mateo. So not the greatest timing for that statement to be made. And it turned out that there were a lot of people in a lot of those closets that he mentioned with a lot of talent. And what YouTube did is it removed a lot of the gatekeepers to unlock that talent. And so we've all seen the results, 2.5 billion people every month using YouTube, the second most visited website in the world after Google. Um, and it's paid out about 30 billion to creators over the last three years. So really has shown that there is a lot of talent in the world and what the internet can do and what tech companies can do is create better distribution to unlock it. So I define a creator as someone who makes something online and shares it on the internet. And so we'll get into this a little bit later when we talk about you know, education and other you know, video making and music and different sectors within the creator world. But um, at its simplest definition, this is how I think of what a creator is. And I like this quote from Jack Conti, who's the co-founder and CEO of Patreon, where he says, I don't like the word influencer because it extracts what brands care about, influence, when it's really all about creativity and self-expression. I don't know about you, but I don't wake up every day to influence. I wake up to create. Um, and so I like to draw that distinction between influencer and creator. Um, and I prefer the word creator, and we can get into that a little deeper. And I also think of creators as businesses. So we often say, you know, creators are the new SMBs, the new kind of small and medium-sized businesses. But really, um, this is not even true. Creators, in many cases, are big businesses. So I like to think of Jay-Z here, where he's got diversified holdings. You know, 15 years ago, he wrapped this line, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. And you can see here, you know, he's used the distribution that he has on the internet with his community to launch probably half a dozen businesses. And creators are big businesses. Mr. Beast, one of the biggest YouTubers in the world, has 60 employees. Kylie Jenner employs 800 people on her cosmetics line. These aren't just the, the new SMBs, but the new businesses, period. So why does this matter? At Index, um, it, the creator economy has brought us some really interesting investments, Roblox, Discord, Patreon, um, Rec Room, and Linktree more recently. And so a lot of the biggest companies in the world are created off of um, the creator phenomenon by enabling people to create content, to connect with other people, um, to monetize a, that content and earn a living doing so. Uh, and so from an investment perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's a really interesting shift to think through. 
Okay. There are lots of misconceptions of the creator economy. So I'm going to go through these quickly so that um, we can get into some of the meteor stuff. But I like to touch on these just to see what people um, are thinking through and uh, how people, when you hear kind of popular arguments uh, against the creator economy, what they're getting wrong. So there was a lot of buzz in 2017, I think it was, when this survey came out of what kids want to grow up to be. And so it came out that YouTuber is the most uh, desired career for young people. So there was a survey of about a thousand kids, about a third of them wanted to be a YouTuber, 18% wanted to be a blogger, vlogger. So, you know, over half of, of people wanted to be a content creator in some way. And it was a lot more desire than being a pop star or movie star, or professional athlete, the kinds of things that when many of us were maybe younger, we aspired to grow up to be. And there was a lot of hand wringing around this, and a lot of people um, were kind of spelling out, uh, you know, the imminent demise of our culture and society and how terrible this was. But one misconception here was that the creator economy is just about money and fame. And actually, if you read the survey, there are other reasons that the kids were more interested in. And so the most cited reason was creativity. Self-expression was number three. And so just as important, uh, more so important than fame and money, kids wanted the ability to express themselves and do what they love and be creative for a living. Also, I'm sure a lot of people, when they talk about the creator economy, have encountered other people who um, you know, say the creator economy is just a new iteration of Hollywood. And we think of this a lot, you know, Barry Diller and YouTube and sort of YouTube creators first iteration maybe were more entertainment focused, but I like to think of it as a horizontal trend, not as a vertical trend. And so just as um, you know, Hollywood will be disrupted by removing gatekeepers and, and more kind of content being user generated and created and distributed online, other industries will also migrate to digital and self-directed work. So examples of this, um, Roblox is really interesting in that there are actually game developers who earn a living and launch studios on top of Roblox. So Megan Plays is a really popular um, developer on Roblox and she makes games and earns millions of dollars a year through her studio, uh, making, making those games and distributing them. Bella McFadden, professional reseller. She was the first person on Depop, which is a secondhand marketplace uh, for fashion to earn a million dollars in sales on Depop. So she's a professional reseller. She will kind of go out and thrift clothes and then put together cool curated outfits and resell them in her Depop store. I think she's sold tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of items there, but that's what she does for a full-time living. Andrew Sullivan, full-time writer on Substack. Um, and so, you know, not just uh, Hollywood's being disrupted here. You know, he used to work for real publications and we see a lot of writers who worked for the Atlantic or the New York Times or um, New York Magazine move over to, to Substack and independent publishers. And then my favorite example, my dad. Um, so during the pandemic, my dad, I encouraged him to sign up for OutSchool, which is an education marketplace we'll talk about later. And uh, he can teach live classes to small groups of kids. Um, and so he is retired now, but was looking to sort of give back and have social interaction, but also share some of what he's learned in his career. And so, you know, not just uh, your kind of next generation celebrities will be part of the creator economy, but even my retired dad will be part of it. And a lot of people say, but if every kid wants to be a YouTuber, we won't have doctors and teachers and engineers. And that's not true. Uh, you saw my dad there who definitely is not just an entertainer, uh, but also examples here like Dr. Mike, who's a doctor, but also a popular YouTuber. Michelle is a teacher. Um, uh, here, M MKBHD, I think is his handle, um, technologist on YouTube. And then this is actually one of my friends, Joelle, who is a medical student, um, but also is part of TikTok's Black Creator Fund and has done a lot of content on TikTok around racial bias in medicine. And so, you know, he still wants to be a full-time doctor. Um, he still is a full-time med student, but also in parallel uh, can use his platform to share knowledge in this way. And last one, a lot of people say creator economy is a media trend. At its most fundamental, it's really about the future of work. And so we'll see later when we talk about some marketplaces, a lot of them are labor marketplaces. But a lot of this movement is really a shift to more self-directed work. It's more disaggregated, a lot of freelancers. Um, and it's really digitally native. And it's really about workers reclaiming agency. The US workforce will actually be majority freelance by 2027. And already we have 
something around close to 70 million people um, working as freelancers in the US. Okay, so let's touch on why this is happening now. Um, there's a confluence of things going on. Um, I spell it down to kind of three, COVID, the rise of TikTok, and then Gen Z coming of age. So, you know, we can go through this quickly. Everyone knows what happened with the pandemic, but basically we had this intersection of historic unemployment um, and digital adoption rising at the same time. And this created this unique moment and moving toward being really more of an internet native species. TikTok at the same time was becoming one of the fastest companies ever to, um, I think the fastest to reach a billion users and was showing people that, A, it's easier than ever to be a creator. B, you can actually get discovered with an algorithmic feed, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but this was happening around the same time as the pandemic. So you can see here the spike in the early days of the pandemic and the time spent is growing very quickly compared to apps like Facebook and Instagram and recently overtook YouTube and monthly hours per user. And then also the final piece was the coming of age of Gen Z. So a lot of people think they say, you know, the creator economy is a result of the pandemic or TikTok or it's this recent, um, you know, Thing that uh, external exogenous factors like the pandemic have resulted in. Um, I'm definitely a believer that that accelerated it, but I do think we would be talking about it today um, even if the pandemic hadn't happened. So what's been happening for decades now is the coming of age of Gen Z and Gen Z is finally entering the workforce. And what's unique about this generation is these are people who grew up watching their parents lose their jobs in the Great Recession. They grew up with Occupy Wall Street. Um, they grew up with student debt and watching millennials struggle with that. Um, and then many of them went to enter the workforce and the pandemic happened. And so really there are all these factors that have shifted how Gen Zs think about work um, and made them want more self-directed and flexible work. I like to think of this TikTok. So I spent a lot of time on TikTok and recently I came across this one where it's a stitch where a woman says, what's something that's not a cult, but borderline seems like one. And then this man responds and he says, that would be like 98% of the United States population that has been brainwashed into believing that it's normal to give up five out of every seven days of your week, just to make someone else rich for 40 or 50 years doing something you don't actually, don't even actually enjoy just to get 10 years of freedom before you're too old to enjoy it. So yikes, definitely enough to give you an existential crisis. Um, but you know, I think it hits on a lot of what the younger generation thinks when they think of work. And this, we see this in populism, everyone from Donald Trump to Bernie Sanders support there. Um, we see it in, you know, GameStop and Wall Street bets. We see it in the rise of side hustles and a lot of the crypto movement and the ethos of crypto. Um, and so this is really, I think, the defining trend of our, our time that's powering the creator economy and will change labor and labor marketplaces. And just some stats on Gen Z. So you know, over three out of four Gen Zs want to be their own boss. Half of Gen Zs want to start their own business. Um, a lot of them already are making money through a side hustle. And a lot of them are foregoing traditional paths like college, um, or at least thinking of it to, to go in this new direction. And I always like to summarize this. M many people might have seen these emojis. They're very popular um, on Discord and Reddit and TikTok and any Gen Z place. But they basically sum up... Um, if I had to sum up like what this means when you comment it, it's sort of like the world is happening and there's nothing I can do to control it. So it's like, you know, you comment these when um, you're kind of like wide eyed looking at something and overwhelmed by it. And I think, you know, Gen Z humor is very much gallows humor in some ways. And, uh, you know, this sums up the kind of, you know, we have lost control of our agency to the system and to institutions. And the creator economy is about taking that back and reclaiming agency and actually defining what I want to do for work, um, how I'm going to make a living, and changing all of these sort of built-in societal assumptions that we had. Okay, so at Index, we think of um, the creator triad when we think of investments. And this is basically a framework to think through how um, creators can build, how entrepreneurs can build in the creator world, um, how we can invest. But I basically think of creation as three pieces. So this economy is three pieces. First is the tooling. So how do you actually make content? The second is the distribution. Um, marketplaces are an important part of this, which we'll get to. And the third is monetization. How do you actually get paid? 
So, you know, in the first, you know, it's everything from Figma and Canva for design to maybe Unity and Unreal Engine for gaming. The second is lots of social platforms. And the third, we've had pioneers like Patreon and Cameo and um, Substack and others like that. The best companies often hit on all three, like Roblox and TikTok. You know, I'll go quickly into TikTok as an example. Um, TikTok is interesting in that it's basically innovated on each of these. So for the creation tooling piece, it's made it so much easier to actually create content. So this has expanded the funnel of who can be um, a creator. So on YouTube, very few people actually create content. When you do, you need specialized knowledge and expertise, often expensive equipment. So you're using Adobe Premiere, you're you know buying a camera and a tripod, et cetera. TikTok, you just need the TikTok app. So it makes it a lot easier to create. The algorithmic discovery piece is also important in that it totally changes who can get discovered, where, um, and just unlocks distribution in that you don't need to actually rely on other social platforms. You can actually, if your content's good enough, be discovered by anyone. And then the creator fund, um, you know, TikTok has really kicked off. Here's my my paltry earnings in the TikTok creator fund, um, definitely not enough to make a living, but uh, at least TikTok has innovated in creating um, a way for creators to make money through the TikTok creator fund. And that monetization piece is also being pushed forward. And you can see Facebook now has promised over a billion, um, you know, YouTube, a hundred million, lots of other companies are innovating on how they actually pay creators. And this is a big opportunity, which we'll talk to. So one thing that I like to point to is when we think of the creator economy, a lot of what has been built in the past is um, architecture or infrastructure of this world that's been built for gatekeepers. And so, you know, here's an example of the economics of music. So where does your $10 Spotify subscription go? And when I made this, I think it probably is out of date and not totally accurate anymore. This was a couple of years ago, but um, it's mostly true in that you can see Spotify only gets 33%, so about a third of your subscription. The record label gets a lot, the publisher gets a lot. The songwriter and artist each only receive around eight to 10%. And so there are a lot of intermediaries and brokers here who take value along the way. And a lot of the creator economy is removing this gatekeeper level um, to make it more available to make a living. So we talked about the monetization piece being broken. Being in the top 3.5% of YouTube channels, you actually only earn 12 to 16,000 a year. That's right around the federal poverty line. And most YouTube creators, 97% aren't making minimum wage on YouTube. This is Shelby Church who posted a video. Uh, we actually had her at the Index Creator Summit, but she has been very candid about how little she can earn um, on YouTube. So she had one video get about 4 million views and she only made about a thousand bucks off of it. And brand deals are still the main way to make money. And I will move through this because I know we're running out of time, but uh, these are some of my cringeworthy and very inauthentic brand deals in a past life. And uh, platforms of this past era, like Instagram, have 100% take rate. So what I mean by that is, you know, the creators earn, um, they are the lifeblood of the platform and create content, but there's no actual built-in way in the social place, in any of these marketplaces to earn um, earn a living and earn income. And so what people have to do is innovate in different ways like brand deals. And one of the stories that we're seeing right now in not just the creator world, but consumer tech broadly is this massive shift from advertising to digital commerce. So we're seeing things like subscription with Substack, tipping on Clubhouse, uh, virtual currencies in worlds like Fortnite and Minecraft and Roblox. Um, and it's really this shift to commerce related transactions. And you can see even things like uh, OnlyFans, which is a massive business, have innovated with different ways to tap into different levels of access to a creator. So on OnlyFans, for instance, as a creator, I could send a locked direct message to all of my fans. It looks very intimate. It looks one-to-one -one, and they can all unlock it. And um, I could earn massive income from that. So it better monetizes the direct one-to-one -one connections. And OnlyFans has used that to reach billions in GMB. Okay. Let's talk about a couple different marketplace opportunities and how we can think through the opportunities in the creator space. So within the index portfolio, there are a few interesting ones that I'll touch on briefly. Um, many people probably know Etsy, which was one of the kind of original uh, marketplaces pushing forward the creator movement. Um, so Etsy is really interesting in that it you know, 
really offline makers and artisans are able to make a living on a platform. And so it was one of the first ways that it created a new career of, you know, Etsy seller or Etsy maker. Um, anchor store is an interesting parallel to that, where in some ways, anchor store is the B2B version, um, where it's a marketplace that allows makers, artisans to sell to wholesalers um, to get their products into their stores. Um, so that's another really interesting one. Printify is a marketplace where a creator can find um, a place to print their custom goods. So say I'm Mr. Beast, I want to print a bunch of Mr. Beast t-shirts. I can use Printify to match up with um, a place to do that. Juni Learning is an education company um, for you know finding a tutor or finding someone to teach you about a subject. And then Curtsy is a reselling platform. We talked about Depop earlier and people making a living there. Um, Curtsy is focused on Gen Z women. And GOAT, many people know, like many people make a living on GOAT uh, selling items like sneakers and shoes and other goods like that. So I'll also talk through three sub themes within marketplaces that I think are interesting um, for the intersection of marketplaces and the creator economy. So first, education. Um, two examples are OutSchool and Cambly. So OutSchool I mentioned earlier is the one that my dad uses. It's a large marketplace where, for live um, online learning. And so someone like my dad or someone or a professional teacher could spin up a curriculum and then um, teach it on OutSchool. And they're often curiosity-based learning. So it could be something like, um, you know, learn Spanish through Taylor Swift songs or learn um, critical thinking through Dungeons and Dragons and small groups of students, really global learners, people all over the world can learn together from the teacher um, throughout school. It's a really interesting model and out school teachers really a new career as we talked about these effectively being labor marketplaces. Cambly is a really interesting one where it's a language learning marketplace. And so if I'm looking to learn English, something like I want to say it's between one and three billion people in the world are actively learning English, um, and they can do so through Cambly. So often when we learn something, we do everything to learn that language except actually speaking that language. So we you know, do little quizzes and flashcards and things like that, uh, but we don't actually converse with people in the language, and Cambly lets you do that. And so you, as a language English language learner, can match up with a tutor for sort of casual conversation um, and that tutor can uh, can just have a conversation and get paid for, for speaking in English. So these are interesting uh, ways that when you think broadly of what a creator is, it's, it's someone who can spin up a curriculum or have a specialized, independent, um, sort of unique knowledge that can be monetized by connecting with other people online. Next is the crypto piece of it. So a lot of people have probably heard of NFTs and social tokens. I know my friend Brem is presenting later today, um, but these are really interesting marketplaces for digital assets. And so OpenSea in many ways is eBay for NFTs. So it's effectively this broad horizontal marketplace where you can sell and buy any NFT. And you can see here in this chart, which is from Dune Analytics, um, just the amount of volume that is flowing through OpenSea. And so in August, OpenSea did about 3.4 billion in GMV in transaction volume, which was actually more than Etsy did in all of Q2. Um, and so it's a lot of volume flowing through here. Uh, you can see it's mostly maintained that pace since then. Um, and so you know the NFT phase is still in very much in the sort of early adopter phase. Um, but you know the volume is is really something to behold. Um, and OpenSea is the biggest marketplace. I think it has about 97% of market share where a creator can you know, sell their digital item um, and a seller can discover different items. On the right here is Foundation, which is, I think of it as sort of a more curated, um, very high quality place to, to discover and sell um, digital art and other NFTs. And so um, very much sort of a curated uh, marketplace similar to, to OpenSea, but slightly more specialized. And then last, I'll touch on commerce. So commerce is really interesting as well. Um, a couple different angles here. So Pietra is a really interesting company that lets a creator spin up a business line. And so we talked earlier about how, you know, creators are not just the new small businesses, but big businesses. And I had Kylie Jenner on that slide. Um, you know, someone like Kylie Jenner can launch Kylie Cosmetics today, which is her line and sell it through Instagram. Um, but traditionally in the past, 
unless you're Kylie Jenner, it's really hard to find the supply chain and fulfillment in manufacturing to actually launch your own business. Pietra abstracts away all of the complexity of that. So as a creator, I can be matched to different suppliers who are the best fit for me. So if I want to spin up a jewelry line or like a fragrance line or a skincare line, I can be matched through Pietra to the right suppliers to do that. And then Pietra also um, has Pietra Marketplace where I can sell that that good at the end of the day and um, and reach people. So it's a really interesting kind of almost dual marketplace in that way, but a great way to sort of build your own business. Um, and as we see more people move to this digitally native work and have a community that is willing and interested in engaging with commerce through that creator, we'll see more people use this. And then last one, whatnot, really interesting live streaming marketplace. So live streaming commerce is a huge and fast growing trend um, and whatnot allows you to, to sell mostly collectibles right now, but moving broadly in live stream commerce. And so I can be matched with different buyers as a live stream seller and vice versa. Um, and it's really an interesting way where, you know, in the future, maybe everyone has their own kind of QVC show or is a professional live stream seller, or just as we've seen on Depop earlier, that's a new kind of profession. So a lot of these, again, just to, to wrap up our labor marketplaces in some ways of the creator economy is very much a new form of work where we get um, matched with different people to different customers and communities and creators are able to find those people online. And it's a new way to, to engage and earn a living online. Awesome. Well, I will uh, now jump over to opening it up for questions and hopefully we can you know spend the last couple of minutes just chatting. One question, um, as creators gain more agency over their output, do you see crypto monetization models getting mainstream among creators over the next three to five years? Um, interesting question. So I would say in a word, yes. My thesis around crypto is that I don't think that mainstream creators or consumers will need to understand or should understand some of the main crypto concepts that people in the crypto world talk about today. So I don't think that your everyday person will know the difference between fungible and non-fungible or understand what on-chain versus off-chain is. Um, and so a lot of those complexities need to be abstracted away. Um, and so I think the answer is yes. I think people will create and sell um, tokenized goods that are on-chain, but I think it'll be very much in a nice um, interface that is very approachable for people familiar with Web2 and, and migrating over to this new world. So what I mean by that is people understand concepts like um, scarcity. So they understand, you know, there might be a limited edition number of these digital assets um, or for a social token, people might understand that, you know, there aren't that many, um, there are only a thousand, you know, Taylor Swift coins out there and I own one and interact with one. So I think the answer is yes, we'll see all creators move toward these sort of crypto related goods and concepts that are tokenized um, and live on chain, but they and their communities won't have to interact with a lot of the more arcane things that today in the crypto movement you have to get familiar with. Awesome. Um, I know we're out of time, so hopefully, uh, you know, feel free to send me a note uh, over email or Twitter, hope to, to meet more folks, but really appreciate the time and Hopefully the intersection of creator economy and marketplaces will be interesting to follow. And in a year, we'll all be talking about some of these trends. So have a good day, everyone.